It seems today, folks, the, the theme is covenants. What is a covenant? Well, it's, a, it's an understanding between two parties. And if it happens to be that one party will get the, many, the benefits from another, it's called a testament. When uh, Adam and Eve sinned and were thrown out of the Garden of Paradise, the human race was in total and complete chaos. You could read that in the first part of the book of Genesis. It was real chaos. It was ridiculous, you know. They didn't know what they were doing. What they were, there was total evil, it seemed, in the world. And then God took pity on the race, came down and made a covenant with Noah. And he took this individual, Noah, and Noah's relatives, etc., made them special people. And there's always a sign with a covenant. The covenant will be guaranteed by the symbol that's with it. And the sign here was, of course, the ark. Now, there are going to be several covenants that will be progressive, progressive covenants, and each one will uh, include what came before and will move up in greater and greater perfection. So the race existed there, and the children of Noah were uh, set apart in a certain sense, and among them was Abraham. Now, Abraham, God made a covenant that we read about in this first reading with Abraham. Abraham would receive all of these things that God promises, and the sign of that was circumcision, and also the efficacy of, of uh, sacrifices that are made. So then the Jews had this. This was part of their covenant, the people of the covenant, chosen people. And then came Moses. And once again, everything remained what was in previous covenants. But then Moses, God made a particular uh, uh, covenant with Moses that they would go into a promised land. And the sign of this was uh, the law. And, of course, the Paschal meal. So everything went along until we come to this incident of the gospel today when uh, Peter, James, and John, representing the apostles, the spokesmen, you might say, of the apostles, came to get a kind of a, uh, a foretaste of a new and ultimate covenant, which would be the last covenant. And that's the covenant of Jesus Christ. Standing there were Moses and Elijah, representing the former covenants, Moses representing the law, Elijah representing what was to come, the forecoming, as, a, as the prophet. And this covenant was a brand new covenant, and it perfected all of the others. It, and as St. Paul tells us, it did not involve what was necessary in the previous covenants, circumcision, uh, the law, or these other things, because it is a spiritual covenant. It's a covenant that God made through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, with us. And the sign of this covenant, taking the place of circumcision, was baptism. And the sign taking place of the uh, Paschal meal is the Holy Eucharist. And it is a spiritual covenant. We, my dear friends, are fortunate to be members of this covenant explicitly. Now, when God created the human race, this brings up certain problems to me. Uh, when God created the human race, we read that he wanted men to be saved, humans to be saved. Yet we know from the earliest days how many were saved. I don't know. Uh, but I think baptism comes in three possibilities. The one that we know, which is explicit, pouring with the water, so whom we've all received. And we have the explicit knowledge of uh, what God has revealed and how we are to live our lives. But there's also a baptism of blood. Certainly we see that in the case of the Maccabee brothers in the Old Testament, as well as many among us today. And there's the, te there's the baptism of desire. That's a tricky one. <clears throat> but I'm sure 
It's the baptism that all of the fathers of the Old Testament had and are now in heaven because they had baptism of desire. They were baptized through this desire which symbolized the baptism of water. How about the myriad of people who led very, very good lives? Take, for example, the old Greek philosophers. Or take the Stoics of Rome, people like Seneca and Cicero, people like this, who lived very good natural lives and uh, virtuous lives from a natural point of view. What about them? I don't know. Did they have a baptism of desire? Dante put them in kind of... The church has never spoken this, so we don't know. Dante had put them in a kind of a, a, a limbo of their own in the Divine Comedy, etc., they couldn't see God directly, but that was his opinion. That's an opinion. But did they have baptism of desire? I don't know. All I know is they were in a much more precarious position than we are. Folks, there's evil in the world. There always has been evil in the world. I'd say the vast majority of people are naturally good. I mean, they, they, they aren't evil, you know, but most of them are, are people of the simply of, of nature. They have an obligation to follow the natural law, the, the law which governs nature, the law which governs human nature. And uh, if they do that, I think they would have a kind of a baptism of desire. But there are others who absolutely revolt against this. There is evil, unfortunately. Paul speaks of this. You see this in this age. For many, as I've told you, and now I'll tell you even in tears, conduct yourselves as, en uh, you have themselves as enemies of the cause of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. Their minds are occupied with earthly things. Because on, but our citizenship is in heaven. Now, folks, there's only, there's one choice, uh, two choices that we have in living. There are only two choices. One is for Christ in heaven, or the other is for Satan in hell. There has to be one or the other. You've got no other, a third choice. There are those who, I suppose, are intent upon evil. They're, God help them. But how about the majority? I don't know. If God created the universe, I'll just bring this up to you as, as a possibility for you thinking about it. Because there's, the church gives no answer to it or anything else. It's a matter of one's own uh, thought. If the majority of people that God has created go to hell, hasn't God in a certain sense lost the battle with Satan? I mean, God created us to, to, to go to heaven. And if the vast majority are going to go to hell, uh, it looks like Satan has won. God is one, you know, in those who, who go to heaven. But how about those others? So I maintain somehow or another God is going to pull this victory out of everything. Uh, yes, I maintain people do indeed go to hell. But they go to hell because they want to. They have deliberately chosen and made that choice of going to hell, of standing against God. But they have to know better in doing, making that choice. And they do this by their evil living by the refusal even to live the natural law, much less the divine law. But I mean, think about that. That's all I'm going to say about this subject. If I think of something else, I'll preach it in another homily some other time. <laughs>